Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another lecture series from Chem Complete. And today, what I want to take a look at is aldehydes and ketones. So this is going to be the first lecture of a multiple series lectures on aldehydes and ketones. I do have some older lectures on my channel. When I say they're slightly outdated just from a quality and technology standpoint, not necessarily the information involved in those videos. Uh, so what we're going to do, this is going to be the first lecture that is going to simply assess what is an aldehyde and a ketone from a functional group standpoint. Then after that, we will take a general look at the two major ways we can view aldehydes and ketones in terms of reactivity, various reagents that we line up with them, and how we would expect them to react in those conditions. And then finally, we're going to take a look at the difference between the reactivity of an aldehyde and a ketone, because it turns out that aldehydes are slightly more reactive than ketones are and there's reasoning very solid chemical reasoning and theory behind why they behave in a slightly more reactive manner than ketones so all of that is coming up on the channel right now okay so when we take a look at aldehydes and ketones, the first thing we want to do is actually identify what is an aldehyde and what is a ketone. So from our review of functional groups, an aldehyde is any time that you've got a carbonyl group. And remember that a carbonyl is a carbon-oxygen group with that double bond in between, and then you have something on either side of the carbonyl. Okay, so an aldehyde group is going to just have the hydrogen on the other side. And remember that R in organic chemistry literally stands for rest of molecule. Okay, the R there stands for the rest of the molecule. And so that could be anything, but generally when we start talking about R, we usually equate R with some sort of a hydrocarbon group. So we're talking about some sort of CH group. Maybe it's a methyl, an ethyl, a propyl group. Okay, um, R could certainly be other things. There could be other functional groups there, but generally it's just a placeholder as we identify the specific functional group that we're actually interested in. So this is an aldehyde, and then a ketone is very similar, and that's why we study them together as far as their reactivity and their properties. Usually when you study organic chemistry, when you're presented with this chapter in undergraduate studies, it's going to be presented as aldehydes and ketones because they're from a reactivity standpoint. There are some small differences, but generally they're the same sort of class of compound. And so they're going to undergo the same types of reactions. So a ketone is going to be an R. You got your carbonyl group. And then you're going to have another R group. Okay, so another hydrocarbon specifically. So for instance, acetone, both of these R groups would be CH3 groups. And acetone is one of the most common or well-known ketones, uh, commonly used as a solvent in organic chemistry. And then it's also used, uh, we certainly know with open market sort of stuff where people use it for uh, removal of nail polish or other types of household projects. Okay, so that's your aldehyde and that's your ketone. Now what I want to do next is take a look at the structure. Specifically, I want to take a look at the structure of a carbonyl. And this is going to be important when we go even beyond aldehydes and ketones. So when you're looking at uh, the other carbonyl functional groups like esters and amides and carboxylic acids, this is still going to be a very important lesson that we're going to talk about right here. So let's take a look at the carbonyl structure and the way that it's set up. So when we take a look at a carbonyl structure, you've got the C double bond O, and the C double bond O is important in the structure because it sets up a dipole, right? It sets up something where we have an unequal sharing of these pi and sigma electrons. And because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, I expect that I have a partial positive carbon and I have a partial negative oxygen. So this, almost like a 
uh, difference when you have magnets, right, like an electromagnetic pole, is going to set up the carbonyl for very specific types of reactivities in very specific types of scenarios. So the two different ways that you can view this is number one, if you have something that is negatively charged or can act as a nucleophile coming in. Okay, so we can just represent this with a negative and then I'm going to put here just an X as a placeholder and maybe we'll put a lone pair or several lone pairs on that, right? To represent that whatever this group is, it's negatively charged, it's rich in electrons and therefore it would act as a good Lewis base. It's going to be able to donate some of that electron property. So just using a little bit of logic, we come back over here and we know that electrons are going to repel other electrons, right? Negative charges and negative charges don't mix well together. And they're going to kind of, from a steric perspective and from an electronic perspective, they're going to want to stay away from one another, right? So what we do have here is that the general electron flow is going up in this direction and the carbon is relatively electron deficient, right? It's electron poor. So almost like a attractive magnetic force this nucleophile would want to come and attack the carbonyl. That would be the site of interaction there, right? Because the positive is going to attract those incoming negative electrons. That carbon's in need of electron property. That's going to open up the pi bond at the same time. And so typically, whether it's an aldehyde or a ketone, okay, if you have some sort of a negative charge, that's coming in, it'll attack the carbonyl and then the pi bond will open up. So you'll end up with some sort of an intermediate, right? That's going to look like this. X came in, donated a pair of electrons, and now the oxygen is going to be in this state, right? The oxygen's now in the negative state and the pi electrons went up to form a pi bond. Uh, the, excuse me, the pi electrons, the pi bond went up to form a lone pair. So, you might have something else on this side, right? If it was an aldehyde, you'd have a hydrogen, okay? Or if it was a ketone, you would have your other hydrocarbon group. So that's the first way that we can start reacting aldehydes and ketones with things is if there's something that is negatively charged or even if it's neutral, but it's got lone pairs of electrons. So it makes a good nucleophile, then this would be the general path or the start of the mechanisms that we would see. Now, on the opposite side, you could also have something that's acidic in nature. So now let's take another look. Okay, in this case, we'll use a ketone for our carbonyl. So we've got our ketone. The carbonyl, again, is set up the same way. Meaning that I've got a partial positive here and I've got a partial negative up here. So now if I've got something acidic, it's not negatively charged. It's really from a, at least from a Bronsted-Lowry standpoint, from a definition of acid base, I'm looking at something more like this, right? That's going to generate protons or H+. Well, what we do know is that H+, doesn't have any electrons to give. So from a mechanistic standpoint, it can't be sending electrons out and attacking the carbonyl. That wouldn't make any sense. This is positive. It doesn't have electrons to move around and it also would not be wanting to interact with something else that is electron deficient. So in this scenario, the best thing is that the carbonyl uses the partial negative because that oxygen through its electronegativity has some excess electron property. That oxygen reaches out and forms a bond with hydrogen. And so what we get as our first intermediate is this other interesting looking compound where you have an OH group and now the oxygen has a positive charge here right and we still have our other R group here now what's interesting about this is that this process actually makes the ketone more reactive than if there were to just be a negative charge there uh, like we had in the first example and the reason for that is that you've taken something that is electronegative, so this was already partially negative here, right? And you forced it to donate these electrons. Now this is positive. So you have an electronegative atom with a positive charge, which is 
which basically means that oxygen now has an even greater reason to pull on or to try to take these shared electrons than it did in the kind of neutral electronegative state. Right now, the oxygen is deficient and it's a stronger electron pulling partner in that bond. So it's going to get very aggressive in trying to pull that up. So in turn, what you end up with is you really create a massive partial positive down here, far greater than the one that we saw in the first example, because again, that uh, the, the proper term that most chemists use is that activated complex, meaning that we've really turned on or activated the carbonyl compound so that it's even more reactive towards these potential groups, right? Now, in step two, whatever it might be, I can bring in some X, right, or some separate compound and that will very easily gravitate towards, right? And then I could open this up and I could have an alcohol in the intermediate, okay? So those are the two ways that aldehydes and ketones usually approach reactivity in the first step. It's the carbonyl is central to this chemistry and you've got negatively charged compounds or nucleophiles seeking out that partial positive carbon and then if you have something that's positively charged, mainly acidic, then you're taking the excess electron property on the oxygen and you're seeking out that proton or that hydrogen that's electron deficient with that electron property. And that makes an even greater uh, partial positive charge or difference or gap in electrons for that carbonyl. And therefore, it's very reactive towards things that could potentially come in. Now, the last thing that I mentioned that I wanted to talk about was the fact that aldehydes are technically more reactive than ketones when they're put into similar situations. And there's a reason for this. Okay? So the reasoning that goes into this, and I'm going to show you a basic example here. Okay, here's an aldehyde. And here is the corresponding ketone which would be acetone. So we have acetaldehyde and we've got acetone. A very similar in structure. Only difference is that terminal hydrogen versus a terminal methyl group on the right hand side. But what I want you to think about is if this is a partial positive and a partial negative, imagine the oxygen actually takes up for a moment this set of pi electrons and nothing has come in yet. Let's just say that it goes into this alternative form, right? This resonance form that really wouldn't be highly supported. It would be an extreme minor contributor because you're ruining the um, octet. You're ruining the valence of the carbon in the bonded structure. But just humor it for a moment and think about it this way. Okay, so here's the carbon. And then I've got this oxygen right and then if i come over here and i take a look at this did the same thing okay and yes that oxygen it would have a negative charge but i don't want to put too much on here to make it distracting because the point that i want to make here is in this case the oxygen is negative but more importantly what i want you to focus on is that the carbon would be positive it would be a carbocation we'll take a look at these two structures if I have a carbocation here, this is a primary carbocation, and this would be a secondary carbocation. And we know from a stability standpoint that carbocations are going to favor secondary and tertiary forms compared to primary forms, and certainly not methyl forms. And that has to do with the available hyperconjugation to the charge. So if I take a look here, I only have one methyl group that would be available to get involved in hyperconjugation with this cation. And here I would have two of them, okay? So coming back up to the top, what I want you to realize is when aldehydes and ketones exist in this state, while they don't have the formal carbocation, they do have a partial positive. And what a partial positive really is, is saying we're on the way to creating a carbocation, right? It's not a formal charge that's positive, but it's got a lot of that carbocation character. It's starting to head in that direction. And so therefore, it can still benefit from the effects of hyperconjugation. So aldehydes have more limited hyperconjugation. Ketones have a greater degree 
of hyperconjugation. Okay, and so what does that mean? Well, we know that if you have more hyperconjugation, you're going to be more stable as a general structure. Okay. And then if you have less hyperconjugation, you're going to be less stable. And a pairing with less stable is what? More reactive, right? If something is less stable, generally speaking, it is more reactive. And this is why aldehydes are more reactive than ketones, because they do not get as much hyperconjugation in that partial positive state as the, keto as the ketones do. And so this partial positive is a little more partially positive than this one is. Okay? And that's, again, because of the hyperconjugation. So that is it for this lecture. The next one that I want to give is going to be on the nomenclature, the naming of aldehydes and ketones. So we'll walk through that and then we'll start preparing some synthetic and mechanistic reactions afterwards. So we'll take a look at how to actually prepare aldehydes and ketones, what sort of reactions can we use, oxidations, reductions, things of that nature. And then on top of that, we will look at the reactions of aldehydes and ketones after they've actually been made. Okay. So again, that is it. Please, I encourage you to like the video if you found it helpful, yada yada, do all the normal stuff, right? If you're not subscribed and you found that this was helpful, we try to push out content. So if you need help or you are studying, continue forward with supporting the channel that way. You can also always head over to chemcomplete.com. You can check out what we have there. We have guides on how to pass organic chemistry that I've written. There are guides on spectroscopy if you're struggling with NMR, IR, things like that. We also have a free YouTube course on that. So don't miss out if you need free resources and you need it explained well so you can understand. We go through practice problems. That's available there too. All right. Enough rambling. I'll see you guys in the next video where we will be naming aldehydes and ketones. Take care, everybody.